Captain's Log Supplemental. Hey, Jeremy, you know, uh, you know those race cars you're you're busy building. Yeah, I do. I got one that I'm looking at every day. You know what? Uh, I don't see you working on. You don't see me working on the amazing Sentinel system yet. That's true. It would take all of ten minutes for you to have one, and it's very quick and easy to install. It is. It is, and we could watch you when we are not at the race with you. And see how you're doing. And then we can call you up when you get out of the car and tell you everything you did wrong. And and I love that because so many years I've been driving and not been able to see what I'm doing. I know. And now we can. I know. You know what I'd like to do with the, the video? The, my most favorite thing is I take the video and I load it on YouTube. And then I send it to my coach and say, look at 26 minutes and 17 seconds. Look at this one lap and tell me what I can do better. And every single time, you know what they say? Everything. Exactly. Precisely. So with the Sentinel system, you get instantaneous feedback plus useful feedback that unfortunately is accurate for my driving. I think it's accurate for all of our driving. Mm, pretty much. Yeah, that's probably true. Yep. But you need to get one in your car, sir. Yes, I do. And with the discount code that you're going to tell everybody, they can save 10%. On mm -hmm. this awesome system. Yep. Trouble free. I haven't had an issue getting video every time we've gone out with the Sentinel. It's always worked. Can't say the same for some of the other systems we've tried. So I don't know. It's on the podcast notes down there. Don't do not do it while you're driving, though. We like to have our listeners live. It's good. From the great halls of their house, there are assembled three who hope to one day be the world's greatest driving heroes. Created from the cosmic legends of the universe comes our team captain, the Vision, Bill Fisher. And their soon-to-be Wonder Woman, Vicki Fisher. And our Captain Marvel and head flight trainee, Jennifer Scripchuk. Their mission, to fight injustice share what is right and wrong to get you out of your house and come out racing with them and serve all mankind. They are the Garage Heroes in Training Team. You good to go? Yep. All right. Yep. Wor world's longest intro coming up. Welcome to the Garage Heroes in Training Podcast. I'm going to be one of the hosts for this episode. My name is Bill. Who else is hosting? I'm Vicky. Miss Vicky, we have returning yes. guests. Yes, we do. Making making his third lap podcast mm -hmm. host of Lizard Brains Podcast. One of the podcasts that I have not missed a single episode of, and one of the few podcasts that has a sticker on our lift in the hangar. So that's always fun. <laughs> Race racing coach. Oh, by the way, some of the best merch ever. I uh, just thought I'd let you know that, which we have a bunch of. And uh, let's see, podcast host, racing coach, GLTC champion, one lap of America champion. I don't know if it's two or three times. It's basically every time he's been in except one. Uh, champ car national champion. Now we're going to settle an internet uh, discrepancy because there is a huge argument. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, sir, even though you don't technically exist on the podcast yet. You know Carlton McCar guy, or the internet says it's Carlton the car guy. I think there's some enunciation issues on the podcast. We'll settle that among the many, many things. He's returning to IMSA this weekend. He is the six-time solo national champion, and we knew him when he was only the five-time solo national champion. Everybody knows Tom O'Gorman. Dang, you weren't kidding when you said longest intro ever. That's killer. <laughs> round of applause, round of applause. Uh, uh, it's fine. So <laughs> let's start with the most important part of this podcast. Is it Carlton Mick Car Guy or Carlton the Car Guy? Mick Car Guy. But That's you're right. That's where I'm at. You know, pronunciation is not our strong suit on the Lizard Brains podcast. You've heard us read our emails. You've heard GJ try to pronounce the Montreal Canadian Grand Prix circuit. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. We don't worry about pronunciation too much. So if it's... Nope. The car guy, whatever. Yeah, I was like, I'm like, how do you get a car guy from that? But anyway, that wouldn't be a very good name. But uh, <laughs> Miss Vicky, are you aware of Carlton? No, uh, no, I'm not. So, oh, so 
uh, DJ is the co-host with Tom on the Lizard Brain podcast, which is a can't miss podcast in my mind. Sometimes I wake up too early in the morning. If you could schedule the release a little later, I'd sleep more the night. But that's, that's <laughs> mine. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, right. And and then that's uh, no, actually serious. That's a problem. I have issues. Uh, so uh, I think DJ and Tom think, and I'm I'm sp- putting words in your mouth, so you can you can do the worst thing about racing is the car and working on the car, which I share. By the way, it's a tool. I would like it to be a hammer, something that just won't break. But none of our cars do that. Anyway, so being uh, proudly anti-car, they came up with Carlton Car Guy, who is a a voice effect for one of the one of the hosts. I'm not going to say who. I'm not going to give away any of it. But uh, one of the hosts. And uh, I think my favorite time was when you had Randy Popes on, and he was totally <laughs> confused. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It was there, yeah, basically he exists because we're we are self-declared not car guys. So we have to manifest the like the counterpoint of what a car guy would think sometimes. And that's where we came up with Carlton. The car, uh, now I'm not gonna have to be now I'm not gonna be able to say it since you said the car guy. That's gonna I know. Carlton the car guy gets he gets whipped out every once in a while when we have to talk about cars. But he was an ambush guest on when Randy Popes was on, and he Randy had never listened to our podcast. He had no context what was happening, but he could see the host that was speaking. <laughs> he could see what DJ was doing, and he's probably like, what on earth is going on right now? And you could tell his reaction and his face, especially if you go to the video episode, you just watch his face while it's happening. It's classic. It's great. It is. We, we had a similar effect a little bit before that. We had a friend of ours who's since passed away, Johan, uh, and he had this persona when he went to a lemons race where he he adopted an, a whole new person and vicky and jennifer were not aware of it so when i had johan on the uh first part of the episode and then i went into our stupid little fast and furious story time questions which we may subject you to some of those but that's just fun uh he switched over to the gd yo man and vicky and jennifer were on the podcast not knowing that he does this or that he did this and <laughs> They're just looking at each other like, what, what, what's going on? Where did, where did this nice, mild mannered, you know, amateur endurance racer, you know, uh, brain surgeon? I think he was a brain surgeon, um, surgeon for sure. Go where? Where did? Where did? And who is this guy? And they looked the same, and they were just baffled for like five minutes. So yeah. five minutes. endless fun. So it's a, it's tried and true. Nothing, nothing works better than springing something on your, uh, your guests, much like we did when your first time came and we came fully dressed with the appropriate eyewear. So, you know, that's good. You know, <laughs> the magic of podcasting. Exactly. You know, if you can't entertain yourself on the podcast, the odds on you being entertaining on the podcast goes down dramatically. That's the secret <laughs> of podcasting. You, that's why everybody who has a, a podcast has a podcast because they just talk about whatever they want. <laughs> You can just talk about whatever. Someone's going to listen to it. I know. We had a few guests who said, you know, I I don't mean to, you know, dash all over the place and meander. And and I'm like, that's like synonymous with podcast. So you're fine. We got plenty of tape in this machine. It's good. You're good. (laughs) So, Mr. O'Gorman, you have experience at levels of racing that we have never even dreamt of getting to. However, one of the things that we constantly bicker about internally, and we have you know, a bunch of our teammates is some of the similarities and differences in approach between endurance racing and sprint racing. And then as you climb up the ladder, how those things uh, converge and, and still diverge. We have differences of opinion. So instead of us talking about stuff we know nothing about, we thought, I know a guy who knows just, just a touch about this. You know, I could do the intro again right here. If you want, I can, I got it. It's, <laughs> I'm like one of those old uh, old toys where you pull the string out the back and it just uh, six time national champ. Uh, anyway, so Mr. Gorman, you've done a bunch of sprint racing. You've done it. Uh, you've done autocross, obviously, since you're the six time national champion. Uh, how how is like a driver at the various levels? How should they approach endurance racing versus sprint racing? And and is is it different? Yes, the race endurance racing versus sprint racing is very different in some ways. And we'll obviously get into that. But I will challenge you a little bit on the theory that the racing you guys have done is not the same as the racing I've done. Because at the end of the day, we're driving a car around a track. It's just that someone has convinced everyone that the type that I've been able to do a couple times is mm-hmm. more important for some reason. The activity is basically the same. So um, everything that I talk about here and that you talk about is going to be 
applicable at all levels. It's just the sprint racing style versus the endurance racing style. And then maybe the series you're in, you know, I have to buffer what I, what my expectations are when I go to a champ car race, for example, uh, versus an IMSA race. Uh, but the activity on track is not where I do that so much as how fast can I come into pit lane before I really get in trouble? Uh, you know, things, the operational things where when, you know, the, the lizards like me want to like compete 10 out of 10 at the expense of everybody else. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the, ch the champ car people don't necessarily love that. Well, the IMSA people are expecting it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, those are where the differences also come in, but, uh, how are, how are endurance racing and, 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 uh, sprint racing different? Obviously it's just the amount of time you have to make things happen fundamentally is the only difference. Um, but it's amazing how much that seeps into all the different aspects of the race, including how quickly you can choose to make your moves and take your time on track or the amount of time that your car can overheat and, and take abuse and this and that and the other. Um, so you, you definitely have to like drive to the amount of time that you're going to be on track. I would say that the most intense stuff that I've done recently is really the GLTC stuff. Even when you're, you know, some of those races where they're not necessarily side by side and they're nose to tail and you, there's not a lot of like racing action, that level of intensity of essentially putting in a qualifying session, but only not being able to slow down. Like you have to go the whole time at qualifying pace is completely different than, you know, a stint where you get into the car and you pull out on the track while the, the race is already running. And then you're, you're establishing your rhythm and starting to pick things away there. Okay, so from a driving perspective, everybody, you know, you've been to a, a paddock or two. Everybody talks about tenths, right? I'm driving nine tenths. I'm driving eight tenths. I'm driving ten tenths. Some people that they get mad at, they're driving eleven tenths. Whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know never, where all these. I, never... I don't know where all these tenths are because I keep looking for shade. But that's a different story. So, oh, is yeah, dad jokes. You got to get one in every episode. It's the God. key. Anyway. God. I know that one was pretty poor. I, I did, you know, I might need Carlton, my car guy on here. But anyway, so is there a difference in the number of tents which, as you go up in quality of car preparation and, and budget? Or is it, you know, everybody drives to maintain the car up until it's time to do some winning? No, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not I'm not really. I'm not really a driver that changes the amount of tents I'm pushing too much. Um, it's more about what the car needs to be catered to. For example, in an endurance race, if a car maybe has some fuel capacity issues, you can't drive 10 tenths in the sense of driving all the way to the every braking zone and threshold braking every single time and using as much fuel as a 10 tenths push lap uses. But you can still use the brakes 10 tenths. You can still use the tire 10 tenths. You can still use the this, that, and the other. It's just you have to lift at the 10 board and coast into the two instead of braking, you know, flat out all the way into the three. Um or if your tire, if your car has tire issues, you would adjust that. If your car has brake issues, you would adjust that. If it has all three, it's probably going to be a little bit of a tedious stint, but you have to adjust that, you know. Um, most of those factors don't come into a sprint race too, too much, especially when it comes down to like fuel. Um, there's, there's a little bit of tire degradation and stuff, but I, I don't believe in adjusting. You know, there's definitely a perception. That's what I was going to say. There's definitely a perception that in, a, in an endurance race, you just go drive six tenths because you have all this extra time to, you know, cover the stint. Uh, or I, I need to turn the wick up to 10 tenths. That's that's a little vague. Um, and I think it, when you get into the details, it's actually about accommodating what your car can and can't do for the amount of time you're asking it to do it. Um, especially are you in the earlier stages of the race, the later stages of the race. If you do come down to the later stages of the race, which does happen often in Champ Car with us right now, if you get a little bit off, off kilter, we have some of the fastest cars. We run them, you know, 10 tenths but we're hitting curbs and we're risking shifting and we're doing these things that the cars theoretically won't do forever and we have to make a decision at the time to say okay now it's time to go 10 tenths and we ended up in that situation at like ncm this year for the championship race things like that um but to be honest that doesn't happen a whole lot in like wrl or imsa or anything like that you're like you're you're pushing pretty hard the entire time it's just a matter of dialing back those little those details of, you know, does my car need to make sure the brakes last this whole race or can it not go as far on fuel as the other competitors? So I need to do a little bit of saving. Those are the adjustments you're making. You're not just like slowing everything down and going four seconds slower. So it's, it's basically uh, wear and impact adjustments, not really driving adjustments. I, I think so. That's, that's the adjustment I make. Um, 
I, I would be actually really curious to hear what other people do in the car because I haven't talked to people about that a whole lot. That's a kind of an interesting question. We did it. We had an interesting question, Miss Vicky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Took us 600 something episodes to finally have one, but we yeah. grabbed one. It's okay. So, Good. so I guess the, the thing that we'd always been under the assumption was as you increase the speed and budget, the car prep gets better so you can push more towards the ultimate threshold. Uh, and then, you know, something like a, uh, let's talk, uh, you know, when Ford wanted to re-win Le Mans, it's basically a budget, whatever you need. And, you know, those guys designed and girls designed the car, drove the car, prepped the car, had, you know, literally cars to spare. So they would drive, you know, 24 hours, 10 tons, just banging that car. And, and if one died, Hey, we've got three of them in the race and we can probably get the other one back out. So that, that was kind of the, the impression that the lower levels has is as you go higher, you drive harder. And maybe that's not. I, no, I, the, 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 the potential for those things to be true is definitely there. The, the lower levels, you know, when I'm thinking of certainly in lemons where it's still kind of half serious is my impression anyway they don't love mm -hmm. when people like too too serious versus you know champ at this point is very serious there's teams with matching liveries and stuff but it's still a specific really? style of car you know yeah i don't know if you've been to one recently but there are at the 24 hour for example i counted five teams with at least two cars in matching liveries running cars we were running three there were other teams running two and three um it's high effort it's it's the effort that the teams kind of can do you know it's it, they yeah. couldn't do an IMSA thing because they don't necessarily have the budget for that but they're probably running the effort pretty similarly outside okay. of when you get to the really intense stuff so so talking about that that really high level stuff for example um every pro team should be tracking that number of hours that are on every part and and, and phasing them out as they come, come up to that you know period where they might fail no one in Champ right. is doing that. That's an insane thing to do in a, in a grassroots level, but it's a thing that you can do when you have the budget and the knowledge of an IMSA team. Um, right. Those <laughs> those are maybe the adjustments you'd be making uh, at the higher level. Go ahead. I was just going to say so so beyond skill, knowledge, budget, and talent, we're the same. <laughs> well, that's kind of what I said at the very beginning. It's well, maybe not all those things, but you know, it's it's He's really not, not that different. <laughs> you know, we, we we grasp our our natural skills and talents and you know once we're past that one then uh you know we just kind of fake the rest of it it's fine right it's good <laughs> so so if if the cars are driven nominally plus or minus you know not exactly the same but if they're, if they're driven plus or minus the same what could an a grassroots racing team do that we could adopt or steal you know or the sincerest form of flattery whatever the, <laughs> sure the the big boy teams are doing from you know pro and and high level amateur what are they doing that we could adopt or take a piece of obviously we're not going to have everything buttoned down to the nth degree because you know most of us have something else to do in our lives and uh, that's their full-time gig so is there stuff that you've seen that you're like you know this isn't terribly hard it, it would be great if you know or uh, i'm sure if you've seen it you probably adopted it or, or gave it on to some friends and everything so what can we do tom yeah let me let me start with what doesn't cost money um I mean, there's there's absolutely the, obviously the on track stuff is is the most important. That's what we're talking about with racing is uh, the amount of time lost in traffic is is very significant amongst lesser experienced drivers, and it's uh, it's something that I actually talked a lot about with uh, with some drivers at the most recent Champ Car race I did with some friends. It was uh, a couple one lap friends, um, mm -hmm. and th so they're obviously very experienced drivers. They've done Champ Car for a while. And we were kind of taking a note of like the, we were just watching like 30 minutes of my stint, 30 minutes of the other driver's stint, 30 minutes of the third driver's stint. And they were noticing like just the level of intensity that I maintain in the effort to get through traffic versus the times that they choose to take their time. Um, obviously that's not a, that's not a free thing that you can change, 
Um, but that's a, that's a massive influence on these grassroots amateur races is just minimizing time lost um, and, and decision making. I would say probably the biggest thing that people make it like a practical mistake people make in losing time is getting too committed to the line. And instead of driving the line that they are overly committed to in their brain, if they were willing to attempt outside passes or if they were willing to change the lines on the track, but maintain the level of grip that the car has. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Push the car to the limits that it can do without being so overly committed to the line that when, oh, the line was taken. Well, yeah, but you might have still been able to make the pass here this way or the other. The other mistake that people make is by charging all the way up to the car that they're trying to pass and then figure out how to pass. When what you've done is remove the opportunity to have any momentum on that car. So I'm always aiming to give myself as much space as possible until I'm doing flat hands for those not watching or if you're not seeing this, <laughs> you're, you're leaving yourself a little bit of space so that when you actually have the moment, the line is not occupied or the place you want to go is not occupied. You have the momentum to do it. And that might mean breaking or lifting really early down a straightaway, but then you actually come through the apex and you clear them on the exit versus coming all the way down into their brake lights right at the apex. And now you're stuck. <laughs> um, those, those two are probably the biggest practical mistakes on track that are like free ways to do better endurance racing. Um, off track pit stop practice is free mm -hmm. it seems like the first thing that falls off everyone's lists um nut and bolting the car is free that definitely falls off people's radars especially if the car is already breaking and there's fixing that needs to happen other things don't get tended to um honestly a little bit of a plan for like how do we make sure that we have fuel coming back to the pit lane uh probably not switching up your pit stop roles too much getting people really familiar with what they're doing or not throwing them into a new role on a new pit stop. Um, and then down to like hydration and water and stuff like taking care of each other and having the resources that you need to like, if you run out of water halfway through an eight hour race, that's like a massive problem. <laughs> you know, you just make sure that you have your team kind of accommodated in that way off track. I would say those are all kind of basically free ways to do a better job at an endurance race. Um, and then you start costing yourself money when you start doing the phasing out of parts or the, the better pit equipment or the better tools to do the better pit stops. If you're doing that, I don't know why you would really need that in, in something, but you know, all of those things that pro teams do that, are, that they're basically buying things to be easier for themselves. That's obviously costing money. Yeah, easier, easier or faster, right? Like a dry yeah. break mm -hmm. on the, on the uh, gas stops. Yep. It, there you go. Yep. Yeah. Not going to happen. I don't even think it's legal in lemons, but that's okay. <laughs> right. So that, that would be the trying too hard that they don't really want, which yeah. I think is a good thing. You have to know what you want from your series. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, the way that we always phrase it is if you go to lemons and enjoy lemons for what it is, you can have a great time. And the, and the racing is actually quite good and, and serious when on track and quite not serious when off track. But if you go to lemons and try to change lemons, it won't go well. I mean, yeah. it's that's not what it is. So it's entry level, basically. Entry level wheel to wheel. You gotta start somewhere. That's where I started, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't know if And look at you now. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that one hundred and forty car race at Nelson Ledge just taught me everything I needed to know. That's like, right. I bet I bet you passed a Track bunch of cars management. at one hundred and forty cars. <laughs> I passed a lot of cars. I'm yeah. sure I got passed a lot too. I don't really remember. It was 15 years ago. Oh, oh mm -hmm. well, that was a long time ago for you. That's like half your life. Yeah, yeah legit. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wowzers. So, so Miss Vicky loves uh, starting uh, first stint, although now she's getting fought over with her sister because uh, apparently uh, she likes first stint too. And, you know, yeah. Level, lovely, lovely <laughs> argument between the two of them as to who gets to go what, where. But I, I think. First stint and last stint, at least with the levels that we're at when we're running, you know, stopping for the night, seem to be different. Do you see that with the racing that you're doing, or is it similar? At, at, say one more time. You're saying that the different stints are the different. way that the, the way, way the experience on track is different. The the intensity of the driving is higher the aggression of the driving is higher 
and some of that could be, you know, with four people on the team, one of them could be their, let's say the hot shoe, because that seems to be what everybody likes to say. You know, it's tents and hot shoe. You got to know how many tents you're driving and, and who's the hot shoe on this team. Mm -hmm. so, so it seems like, uh, I, I think one of our jokes is, you know, it's a testosterone fest out there, you know, and then that's the Italian word. So it, it seems like, exactly, you, you, you got to give it one of those, you know, you give it one of the little shakes and, yeah. uh, it seems like those two stints seem to be the, if stuff's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong. Those two, the, the middle of the race is kind of not calm, but controlled, I guess. Is that similar with you guys or? Yeah. That, and that's another interesting point that I haven't thought I haven't verbalized too much. So that's actually pretty different when you get to the higher levels because of the way that pro racing is structured now. A lot of it is structured to accommodate two drivers so that it can be split across more people for costs. And it's built in a way that with driver ratings, there's always a certain pairing of drivers that is required. Like you can't just have two in, in, former F1 champions paired together in a TCR car. Like they they don't really, I think TCR might be the last level where they stop care, start, no, where they don't care about that. But then you get into GT4, GT3, anything like that you're required to have an amateur driver or you have to run in a certain category, you know? So, yeah. hmm. so what that creates is for, for being, you know, the most competitive that you can be, usually the gentleman driver, the slower driver, the paying driver, however you want to call it starts first. And then the drivers will get faster throughout. Unless you're talking like Daytona and the whole roster is a bunch of pros. Um, so that's very different in what you see from amateur endurance racing. When you talk lemons, champ car, even WRL, will often start the fastest driver first. And then you're right, the middle stints are maybe the less experienced drivers or the less confident drivers, or just mm -hmm. the people who don't extract as much lap time, lap to lap. And then the fast guy goes at the end again, or a new, a new faster guy goes at the end person. And unless it rains. Unless, yeah, sure. And that's actually, you're, you're right. So in the first and last stints, you're going to get the most intensity from the lizards who want to drive really hard and, you know, race at every opportunity. Um, but it also is actually kind of interesting when I end up in a middle stint, how different it feels on track, because that is a lot of times when the lesser experienced drivers are in the car. And it's a pretty stark difference, to be honest, when you're in the first hour of a champ car race versus the fifth hour, mm -hmm. uh, you can tell that the fastest drivers started the race, the most racy drivers, maybe let's say started the race. And then, you know, the people who like it a little calmer are, are completely fine with racing in the middle. Um, and this actually, uh, the the reason I think it's interesting is another free way to do better at endurance racing is to kind of take a cue from the pro drivers, uh, from the pro teams and and make competitive decisions on your driver roster. The only problem with that is we all do this for fun and it's really fun to start. It's really fun to finish. So competitively, that may not always make the most sense because of the way the race is structured, but you still have to like honor your friend's wishes and like let everybody have their fun. So I get why it doesn't happen, but I do see a lot of times people will make decisions at the expense of being competitive because they want to make sure that, you know, this person gets to start today or this person gets their drive time today or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not as much of an issue with the, the pro style racing. Yeah. But the pro style, like I said, is so dictated by the way that the, the format is, you know, the IMSA race that I'm doing this weekend, for example, it's technically an endurance race. It's only two hours, but we have a, a pit stop and a driver change and, uh, they will basically start the slower driver and finish the faster driver across the entire race. Unless they start the fast driver, have the mi the middle stint somehow be a short stint for the, for the other, you know, slower, but they require both drivers do 40 minutes. They require um, the certain ratings, like I said, and you're basically making competitive decisions within a much tighter box um, versus amateur is like, everybody's the same. Just drive when you want. Right. Miss Vicky, you uh, you love traffic. You always say, "What's your thing that you're best at?" Here's your chance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the one thing that kind of keeps you alive first thing in the morning. It, it's <laughs> it's your it, cup of coffee. It, it is my cup of coffee. You get a little, but no, there's a there's there's strategy, a little bit of strategy. There's a lot of clustering. And, you know, kind of getting through and kind of getting your position. But, you know, at the same time, you know, you're kind of dealing with like a hundred some cars 
at the same time. And, and they kind of get them to a point where they're spread out. So it was not too, too bad. And, you know, with, with the whole traffic management, you got the three classes. So, I mean, with that, you quickly start to recognize who the, the good drivers are. And the nice thing about first run is that I, I know in our races is that, you know, and we've mentioned this before is that some of the, the cars that go out have never, have never been uh, track tested. So you, you have to, to kind of manage around that, which is one thing. Um, and the other part is that when you start identifying the good drivers, you start, I would try to say lead follow because some of the good drivers, you start recognizing who for that level is like an A class. And when everybody else starts to recognize those people that are coming through the track and, and that A class that's coming through the track, they essentially are ambulances, they're fire trucks and they cut right through. And that is a strategy in itself. Uh-huh. So if you happen to be a mid-level or a lower level racer on your team and you have another racer coming through and it's just parting traffic for you. Yeah. Hop on the tail end of that if you can and hold on for as long as you can, because you know, it, it's, it's a strategy. It's, it's racecraft, you know, and with in our level, you know, again, with, with that many cars on the track, you're able to use race craft. And I wouldn't say box people in. I don't like the idea of like trying to say, you know, box people in, Yes, you but do. well, I don't do it intentionally. <laughs> I, do, I literally don't do it intentionally to be a jerk. I don't lies. I don't do it to be a jerk. You don't do it but, to be a jerk, but you do it intentionally. Well, it, if I have to to get my way around the track <laughs> and I have an ability of somebody that I'm racing for and all of a sudden he's made a bad move and he's moved in behind somebody in, you know, in a C class and I'm racing in B and he, you know, we're going neck and neck and he's like, oop, well, of course, I'm going to kind of play that a little bit and try to take that lead on him. He made a bad move. But, you know, again, with the racing and traffic, is is it does it does you know greatly teach you spatial awareness you have to have you have to be on a swivel so traffic is is it's great for people with add <laughs> it keeps you in the moment I and like that, that that it is first thing first thing in the morning is you are in the moment you're not thinking about what your strategy really is you're not thinking about what that is you are you are feeling everything in the moment. And it's, it's a really surreal thing. It really is. Sometimes when you get on a track and you're racing around and say, for instance, you're racing it at pit and, and you have what 50 to 60 cars on the track, you can probably by the second day go around that track and maybe see three or four, five, six cars, you know, and then you start, you know, you, you have a tendency to get into a lull your body starts to get into a lull and you start getting really comfortable and you start focusing and all of a sudden you're just like, ah, you know, but there's something about first thing in the morning and racing and traffic where you're in the moment. You're not thinking about strategy so much at that time. First thing. So, I mean, that's my take on it. Sure. Yeah. I like, I like, sorry, but go ahead. I I think there was a question in there, Tom. I don't know if you missed it. Well, no, it, I, it, not so much a question, but it raised a bunch of thoughts for me. So I, I like what you're talking about is it, in your experience of being a slower car sometimes with the fast, you know, people with their hair on fire coming through, there's three or four of those in every stint, right? You end up with the opportunity to actually control what they're doing most of the time if you're aware of it as the slower car. And I learned this when I was doing B-Spec. We were sharing the track with, or TCB, we were sharing the track with TCA and TC. And TC was like, the BMW M235Is, which are mm-hmm. pretty fast, and you know Mustang V6s and MX5s and stuff, and then I'm in my little fit. Right. So Almost. I, I realized, like, when they're coming through, I actually have a lot of control in where they can go, where I put them, where I let them go. Uh, and right. I won a lot of races and finished ahead of a lot of drivers that were faster than me because I was able to do that. Um, and simple things like lifting down straightaways to make sure a car passes you before you get to the corner, or knowing your time to 
like you said, block somebody in, in a way that's completely, you're, you're allowed to do this. This is my track too. I'm in my own race and I'm going to position myself in a way that you are not going to want to go by me right now. And I'm telling you that before you get there, you know, I'm basically right. in the middle of the track telling you, you're not going to go down the inside of me down the straightaway. Um, there are those, the, the, uh, I forget my friend just mentioned this, but there's, um, Aaron Lichty from winning formula he had a great line. There's a, what is it? You're, you can, there's this whole, there's a whole book of dialogue that you can speak with your car. I think it's something like that. Mm -hmm. And if you learn how to speak that language with the body language of your car, you have a massive amount of power on track. And that goes for a slower car when you get to go through, when you let other people go through. And it also goes for fast cars with, you know, for me in, 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 in my example would be like with the Rockwell Boxsters and Champ Car, I don't, I think I've only gotten past once and it was a C4 Corvette that was like insane. Um, that means I'm doing a lot of passing, obviously, but that means that I am constantly in picking when to pick my battles mood. <laughs> and there right. are times when I know, like, I'm not really going to catch that car before the braking zone, even though I'm faster. I'm still going to lift halfway down the straightaway to make sure that we both get through this corner as fast as possible. I would say that's one thing that's definitely a big, a big gap in the, in the pro racing paddock versus like the amateur grass um, endurance stuff is every position matters in the in the pro stuff and it kind of does for real versus in endurance racing for like grassroots lemons champ it it really blows me away how often people don't realize that this this battle for this position at this moment doesn't matter and they still <laughs> fight they fight you tooth and nail for it every time anyway and the scariest part to me is when i have that happening and i get alongside i always try to look over and i try to look at the driver and the driver is never looking around they are always dead forward hands on the wheel both and they're fighting for their life and i'm like but we should not be fighting like this right now this doesn't matter <laughs> right. but i'm gonna i'm gonna go by eventually you know that kind of thing um and that that's on the flip side too as the slower car you're like man why are you forcing the issue with this right now this is absolutely not beneficial for you or for me um so that you know there there's a lot of strategy to your point uh, in that right. in that mindset just what battles do I pick? It's the so, same person on the highway who doesn't uh, go 65 in the left lane. Then when you try to pass them on the right, because, you know, speed limit's 70 and I never go past the speed limit. Uh, and then they accelerate. And it's just like, so uh, could you go in a little bit more on on what you were talking about on body language and reading your car? Just kind of like a little little bit deeper dive on that. Sure. Um, I'm, let me let me do a Can I come up with an example quick enough. Let's go to pit race. You're coming out of turn five and six. You're digging really, really hard up that big hill. And then you come up over the top and you're going down towards the S's, right? Mm -hmm. You're in a slower car. You saw that the faster car was coming back out of turn two, but they're not going to get you before turn seven. So I'm coming up out of turn five. The faster car is accelerating up. Instead of tracking out all the way to the left and driving down the normal track all the way on the left and then turning in for turn seven from the left, I might go to the middle of the track or even inside the middle of the track. So their only option is to go to my outside. And the right. only way they would do that is if they're such a bully that they want to just like force the issue into a spot on the track they shouldn't be. Um, that's a body language moment where I'm telling that person, not right now. You should not try to make this move right now. Um, the alternative on the flip side is a fast car, slow car situation. You're in the fast car. If, if you're in a fast car and you decide I'm going to stay at this distance until I want to make the move, you've then basically translated to the driver ahead that I'm not going to try this right now or that maybe they're just as fast as me. So I should just kind of stay doing what I'm doing. I always make an effort if I'm the faster car to make myself appear as much in their mirrors as possible, as fast as possible, because I want them to realize like I'm going to be coming through. If I don't do that, it's because it's on purpose. Uh, I've chosen to like not translate my intention yet. I'm going to give them their moment to focus and then I'm going to present myself. I almost never drive behind somebody directly. I always try to drive out, you know, one way or the other. And then by that, by that commanding, you know, show up in their mirrors, not in their tire tracks, just right up alongside. But I haven't made the move. I'm just telling them like, I mean it. I'm going to try to go by. A lot of times you'll get a response from that by people kind of just opening up for you and letting you go versus if you sit back there for half a lap and then try to like, okay, maybe now's my chance. And then you try to close up. You've, you've, you've told them non-verbally for a half a lap. I'm not really going to try that hard. And I might only be this fast. You know, they might not even keep looking at you. They might just think, Oh, that, that guy's going to stay there. So, um, 
a lot of it just has to do with placement and and confidence in where your placement goes. And um, pretty obvious. And you know, the the statements that you're making with your car are quite obvious. Yeah. There's and, nothing uh, subtle about it. <laughs> no, not really. No. <laughs> and you're not being a jerk. You're just you're just communicating with your car. Right. And and there's definitely some some people that push back on the idea that you could, you know, basically pre-block in my you know, every every actual definition of blocking is a move in response. And you should never move in response to somebody behind you. But if you move before they move and you've put yourself in a position that discourages them from going where they might go that is bad for you and for them, that's totally fine. So uh so I do that a lot. I I really do that a lot, actually. Um especially when I'm in a slower car in a champ car race where I can't just be in a boxster and only get passed once you, you can translate to people behind you very, very often when you're going to let them go and when you're not going to let them go. And usually you get your way, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. pretty good. It's pretty, it's pretty powerful when you start to learn how to wield that. Um, the only problem is you have to learn when it's okay. And when it's not okay as part of that too. Right. And the other person has to pay attention. Right. They may not always agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, some, some. I mean, I'm not bragging, but we race people who wouldn't notice if you hit them with a club. I mean, on on the track, they're just they're just trying to survive. Sure. Uh, I would. I can't say. I don't. I have no response to that. Well, you know, maybe maybe we can come up. We can come up with a way for you, but that's that's later in the podcast. Sure. Um, is there any other? traffic management strategies because when when we're racing sometimes we have a, a c like abc cars we have a c class car and that is the slowest of the classes and sometimes we have a b car and sometimes we have an a car and i find that them to be i don't know if dramatically different but but very different in terms of my weekend and what my brain's going to feel like after i get out after two or three hours this is true so you're saying the faster cars are more taxing basically no actually backwards B is oh. B's the worst. C is probably next. And then yep. A is A is relatively easy because I can just take my rear view window. I mean, my rear view mirror, my rear view window, whatever. That world. You know what I mean. Whatever. <laughs> it's not the first time I fumbled my words in this podcast. Trust me. Uh, and, you know, turn it off. And I'm going to be passed like once or twice a stint, maybe, depending on the car. Much yep. like you with your uh, your boxers. It's it, is there a difference that you find in your approach or in the way that you approached racing and race craft with the differences in, uh, Hey, I'm in a C-class car. It's going to be, it's going to be a struggle to pass anybody this weekend. Yeah. That's a, that's a uh, really good point about the, like the amount of work, the middle class takes. It's hard. <laughs> Not to like, you could, you, Isn't could blow it always? This, you could blow this into whole society. Right. But yeah, that middle class is the hardest to deal with being passed and passing. Yep. I'll tell you, I did the Thunderhill 25 hour a couple years ago. It was the first year with the civic SI and there were 62 cars in the field. We qualified 30th. So we were dead smack in the middle on pace. And it was not just that, but we were literally like 25 seconds from the fastest car and then 25 seconds faster than the slowest car. So we were dead nuts middle in all capacities. And that race was so exhausting because we're getting passed by prototypes and radicals and LMP three cars and GT cars. And then we're blowing past spec Miatas and spec E thirties and, you know, slower cars. And uh, it was just constant. So I, I would say, honestly, I think the easiest is probably you're right. The f anything that's fast in a straight line is easy. Um, mm -hmm. When you're the slowest car, it implies that you're not fast in a straight line. So there's a level of like, you can let that go. But that middle class one that can be really, really exhausting. I think this is actually something I would I would encourage every organization to do. This is something I see they over miss they overstep a lot. Is in the pro levels they will actually set a standard for expectation of where the slower and faster cars should place themselves. And in in the amateur series they don't do that. So for example at VIR in the lower S's when you're coming out of the lower S's but you're not to the bridge yet. Mm -hmm. So you're basically out of turns five and six. They will say, we want the slower class cars to dive right at turns six B or whatever it is, where all the cars would naturally just go straight and kind of try to shorten, shoot the gap of all those wiggles. At the very last one, they want the slow car to, to pull right and continue the, you know, they're not loaded at that point. It's not hard. They just pull over that way mm -hmm. to, to open the lane early for the fast car to go through on the left. Um, Lime Rock is the opposite on the no-name straight, which is after the right-hander before the uphill. 
you go down that straightaway, they want the slow cars to stay left so that there's an easy straight lane for those faster cars to go to the right. Uh, Daytona is the most obvious one. When you watch the Rolex 24, you'll see every GT car stay at the bottom, every prototype go to the top. They tell us all that. They tell you when you're in this situation, this is where you should go. And if you don't follow that and you cause an incident, they'll probably call you on, you know, this is your fault. You were in the wrong spot. I think that Lemons, Champ, WRL would have a massive gain in quality of track time. They would have no work other than saying, if you're at this specific spot at this at this track, at VIR, at Lime Rock, at whatever the track is, and you're in a faster or slower car, this is where you should go in this moment. And it would cause a lot of like those weird exchanges of I'm in an A class car and I'm catching the C class car and I'm catching like fast. It just sets the expectation of where they're going to be. It's very, it's very, very straightforward. So, um, yeah, when you don't set those expectations, you get people going wherever it's, then you're just working you're way harder. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, uh, it does matter. And I, I always think that it, it, it also matters in how you get there. Like I've been the faster car driver combo. Cause in our racing, it's, it's both, uh, I've passed many faster cars, uh, just because of driver difference. It depends on whether I'm the faster car straight line or if I'm the faster car corner or ideally both. But, right. you know, the, the, the approaches and the, the level of concentration are vastly different, at least at, at our level. I'm not sure if it matters with you guys. No, at, at all levels, fast and straight, slow in corners is always easier than fast in corners, slow on straights, okay. no matter where you are. Is is there any philosophical approaches that you do when you have the uh, the struggle bus and you're in the Miata and you're racing against a, a Mustang, for instance? Hmm. I'm not the most patient person, so I'm not always the best. If I'm <laughs> never the one never noticed, Tom. Uh, never noticed. Yes. <laughs> if I'm if I'm the one that's I don't I really hate being slow in a straight line, and I feel like it follows me everywhere I go. But I hate it, and. Uh, if I'm in that scenario, the, the best I can do is remind myself to, to like, usually when that's happening, it's in a long stint. You have a lot of opportunity and a lot of time. So you can either, you know, kind of take the mentality of like driving home in traffic. You can try to change lanes and cut through traffic all the way home to get there three minutes earlier and have your stress levels through the roof. Or you can just sort of take your time and wait for your moment to an extent. That said, mm -hmm. I'm not the best at that. I, I still try and change lanes every chance to get three minutes back, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, because you never know when that chance is going to come. And then when it finally does start to come, you you should have been formulating through that entire time. How am I going to play defense for the next three laps after that? Because you, you, the, the battle is not won the moment you make the pass. Right. You usually lose it the moment you catch another car and then they can just drive past you again. <laughs> yeah. So, so Tom, I, I think you reminded me of something. I'm thinking we share this philosophy philosophy. Uh, when you get in the car, you pop on your ways or your Google maps or whatever it pops in, you pop in your destination your destination comes up. It says 10, 12. Is that a challenge? Not directly. No, I don't think of that. I, but I drive like that. Yes. I, <laughs> I want to get to places. I, my, the thing I say the most in the car probably is don't you have somewhere to be? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like my grandma actually makes this joke all the time. She's like, who are these people out right now? Where do they have to be I'm like dr drive like you have somewhere to be? I don't care that you're out, but like, let's go. Come on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually I kind of I kind of have a running joke with my current one lap teammate, Salil, because he's not that way on in, in everyday life. So he and I have this massive contrast in like I have massive urgency at all times for no reason. And he's just like chill. And we're like road tripping together. So when I'm driving, it's very different when he's driving. And every once in a while, he's like, all right, that was a lot. And every once in a while, I'm like, can you hurry up? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So so I think we've, we've beaten up on endurance racing enough. So I've got a couple things coming up to a particular event we have coming up uh, where we'll both, we're both will be, uh, all of us. The team's going to be going there and you're going to be there. Going to Grid Life at Pit Race, one of our favorite tracks. Love that track. Any tips for passing in the S's? Ooh, I knew you were going to say that. You know, I've actually not spent a lot of time road racing at Pitt. The last race I did there was a champ race in like 2018 when mm -hmm. we had just swapped the, the fit. Um, 
I really don't remember. And I think at that point, that was when Champ was still pretty... It, it was slow enough that that car was one of the fastest cars on track, which would not be the case anymore. So I do. I remember being able to pass around the outside of eight, and I remember being able to set up for runs out of out of eleven. So then you're ending up up the inside of twelve, which is yep. the old track again. Um, oh, the old track. Okay, sorry. Right. I'm, so I'm if you just follow the, that, the big one. So the first, the first of the S's is turn seven. Uh, I don't find my. I don't remember doing much there unless I passed on entry. But that right, that left hander after turn eight, I could pass yeah. the outside there sometimes if people were under the limit. But then if I didn't pass by eight, I don't remember being able to do much with it in turn nine. And then you come over the blind crest at 10. And at that point, you should just be setting up for a pass underneath at the exit of 11 so that you get the inside for that that uphill on the old track. Uphill on the old track. Okay. All right. I know where you're at. Okay. Because it's it seems like it's a risk versus reward. Like we had the same problem as a team at uh, Road Atlanta. I've heard that's the same problem at VIR. In, in the S's in general, at least where we're at it's not really worth it sometimes I mean, like I, give up give up a little bit especially in endurance now if this was a sprint race or or you know whatever uh push it but it's it it's more downside than upside i agree but i find the pit race s's to be a little bit almost more like the mid-ohio s's mm -hmm. where where the vir and road atlanta s's are almost straight so you're you're threading needles but you're right. really doing it almost straight and pretty much flat out versus the S's at mid Ohio are obviously like a big breaking zone. And then you're changing directions in these big sweeps pits a little more like that. So mm -hmm. you can do a little bit more if a car is driving a little slowly, but because you can trust that they're going to go to one side of the track or the other, and there's still space versus like threading these tight needles. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that it's not worth pushing the issue. Usually if you didn't get it done by the time you kind of get into turn eight, Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to get it done until you at least get to turn 12. Yep, pretty much. So you just start planning for that. That's all, right. all I can. So again, staying a pit race because we're both going to be there. And I, I believe we will be uh, participating in a certain track day that someone's holding at pit yeah. race the day before. Is that uh, you with ASM? ASM, sorry. Yep. Yeah, Andy and I, um, ASM rented the track on Thursday prior to the championship weekend for Grid Life, which is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, we also rented the skid pad, which is a six acre paved skid pad. So we have the track, we'll have sessions for wheel to wheel cars, time attack cars, and then HPDE. And then we have an extra, you can either pay an extra 50 bucks or you can only register for the skid pad for a hundred bucks. And it'll just be an unlimited runs, uh, autocross style course. Um, we do these events up in Wisconsin where we allow people to drift or grip drive the autocross course. And we'll set up some incentives for people to kind of drift. Like there's an optional pin cone that you can do a donut around and stuff. But we just kind of add that to an autocross course and let people choose. We let a timer run all day and people love it. They don't work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like a come fun run all day. So we're going to do that uh, at that event as well. That sounds like a great time. Bring on uh, your used tires. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't bring the new ones. Well, don't bring the don't new bring ones out early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it, 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 I'm hoping it's going to be a good event because Pitt is not a track that a lot of people have been to in that circle, at least. I feel mm -hmm. like Pitt's a pretty big staple in the Midwest, but really only with some of the endurance racing series and maybe like track days. Yeah. But I don't, I don't feel like even SCCA or NASA have huge, huge Pitt race weekends. NASA and had the like, Nationals. That's about it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, last year was definitely a big year for that. Um but yeah, with, with Grid Life having not been there before, this is a track, and Grid Life doesn't give you a lot of practice. So it's a track that's, it, I think it's really tough to learn. I don't think it's that tough to do, but I think it's tough to learn because it's so long and it's got a lot of elevation change. So speaking of tough to learn, yeah. there's one there's one turn I don't have a good visual. I'm not the best with visual markers, but I really have like no visual markers for 14. The, the top turn in for 14 the top of the hill onto the back straight with the big curb on the inside do yeah. you have anything you see there or is it just kind of feel <laughs> or is it that let's pick that tree and see how that yep. goes i'm not the best with this either I, i'm a pretty sens sens sensual driver Ooh, Very I'm a pretty nice. sens sensory <laughs> driver um waka waka. Weird, weirdly i have like a there's a there's a rhythm to my driving that once i'm established in the rhythm the references go away mm -hmm. but anyway for that spot the school cones if the school cones are out or the, the track cones the turn in point is like one car width before their track cone, their turn in cone. Mm -hmm. uh, they always put it too late. So if you just turn in before that, you're probably completely fine. If it's not there, it's just earlier than you think. 
and and try to build a reference. I I'm bad with picking a, a visual reference. I just build my my muscle memory reference real quick, um, yeah. which makes it tough for me sometimes to like help the reference driver. <laughs> I yeah. feel like I could help you more than I could help the reference driver, to be honest. Well, I'm not the reference driver, but I like to have them for blind turns. Sure. You know, just as a fallback, like, oh, I'm late, you know, and then I just make the adjustment and figure yeah. it out. But, uh, you know, it, it really it really is like you basically just have to turn right immediately as you finish that left hander. Like there's there shouldn't be a moment of going straight. There shouldn't be a moment of like, when do I turn? It kind of just it kind of is like part of the S's where it's just like you you finish the right hander at the bottom. You finish the left hander at the top and you turn right back to the right at the that that's mm-hmm. kind of the way I think of it. OK, uh, which is so why basically when the car settles, start thinking about turning. No, turn back the other way before the car's even settled. So the weight oh. transfer never even settles, really. Like you just, okay. the weight falls from the right back to the left and you fall over the hill and you're okay. honking up the next rate. All right. Uh, in, in an effort to get ready for the podcast, I found out that I didn't order two things. So going back to going back to professional versus versus lower grassroots levels, do you guys use hand signals for passing or in car communication? Not too often. I try to remember to point people around when I, I point people when I, when I intend to let them pass me all the mm-hmm. time. So there is, there's the drivers that do that. Um, but I would say that the hand signals are most prominent in like the amateur sprint races with like spec Miata and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, Wasn't or, sure. or just track is. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's the Jersey wave, but that's a different communication signal, but that's fine. Right. Right. Um, and then, if if we aspire to to performing at the level of professional racers, uh, one paradigm that we just have no experience with is if I am focused on driving that weekend, and that's my responsibility to the team. After I'm done with my stint, what do I do? Like, I, I know you're almost precluded from working on the car because they're like your job is to drive. Uh, no, but it's just they know better. It won't work if. I well, work. yeah. There's. I was being I was, not a fan, I was, huh? <laughs> I was being a good, being a good host and supporting you there, Tom. You, you kind of blew that one, but that's okay. What Sorry. What do you do besides rest? Do you are you a data guy or or what should the driver do to to maximize Ooh. performance? Yeah, I mean, I find I find data during endurance race weekends to be incredibly difficult. Um. Yeah. You know it's effective on the track on the test day for sure if there's a practice day and stuff but once the race has started there's no real chance to pull it from the car unless you're in champ and you use part of your five minute pit stop for that or does lemons have a a pit stop minimum uh nope i didn't think so the only the only thing you have to do is you have to get out of the car for fuel like there's no no fueling with a person in the car no person in the car i remember that so yeah i don't i don't find there's really an opportunity to even get data and video and stuff so what do you do i mean i for me, I immediately hit like a an electrolyte rehydration drink and get some food, mm-hmm. preferably like bananas, something like that. Uh, I try to get an update on like, I try to give an update on what my scent was like, you know, make sure that they understand all the circumstances with the car I was dealing with. Um, usually I try to do that on the radio before I get out of the car, but then you can be sure. a more detail in person. Right. And then after that, if you have, if you're part of the pit crew stuff, you know, like last weekend, a champ was my first time in a couple of races being a part of the actual pit stop because <laughs> Rockwell brings in a crew, but uh, you just like get an update on the strategy. Where are we in the race? What's when's the next pits window open? Um, who's going in next? Who's in there now? If you didn't even notice who got in after you, that happens. <laughs> um, I can see that. Yeah. So there's, I don't know. There's just an update to the race so that your mind doesn't disappear from like you get so self-absorbed with your stint that when you get out of the car, if you're not like get back into the team mentality. I think you can uh, you can like drop the ball a little bit, just trying to be a good teammate by like getting getting everything back together. But like you said, I'm not necessarily always a core team of the make the car run, go get the gas. <laughs> I go get lunch. I pick exactly. Up food. I think that's why we get along, Tom. Right. I am the uh, I make it myself. I am chief chief gopher, cook, bottle washer, whatever it takes. Right. I get it done. If you if you need a wrench, tell me I'll get it. If you need a wrench turned, I'll find somebody who knows how to do it. It's fine. Mm-hmm. It's fine. So uh when last you were on, there was this new cool tire that I, I knew this guy had, and he was killing it in GLTC. I believe it was the uh 
SR-71. No, no, that's a plane. The RE-71 RS, which, <laughs> which drives like an SR-71. If you have not experienced it, I highly recommend it. How's that tire doing for you? It's awesome. Um, I'm actually on a full Bridgestone, con or not a full, but I don't know what that even means. I'm on a Bridgestone contract this year. Uh, so almost everything I'm doing um, in the grassroots level is all on the Fenza RE-71 RS. Uh, it came around like super organically. I've had a lot of people ask, like, how does that even happen? Um, my PR friend from Honda, the the rep that I worked with most directly at American Honda, after I got dropped, he picked up a new job, wanted to move to the east. He ended up working for Bridgestone, got himself elevated to the head of PR for Bridgestone over those kind of three years, let's say. And it was about the same time that the 71 RS was coming out. So they sent me a set because it was eligible for GLTC at the time. And I ran it the first couple of times and I was like, you know, this thing's really fast, right? Sorry if this is repeating. Oh, and, uh, no, it, it hadn't come out. It was just coming out. Got it. Okay. So I, I used it off and on in GLTC a couple of times, but the, the way, the way grid life allowed it into GLTC was a little sketchy. Um, so I, I tried to be a little fair with how I used it to be honest. Cause the first time I used it, I was like, this thing's fast, like probably out of the window fast. So I used it for qualifying once and I used it for a race four once so I could try to win all four races. But it wasn't until it was available for everybody to buy and everybody has it had it that we started racing on it all the time. Anyway, that was GLTC 2022. We won the championship running it then. Then in 23, I didn't do a lot of racing, but I was still, you know, in contact with them. And one thing that came up was, you know, this is going to be working on year three of this tire. Um, we want someone that's still representing it. We want it to still be visible. We want to make sure that it doesn't get forgotten about, especially if new tires are starting to come out. Luckily, mm -hmm. that hasn't quite happened yet. So we built a schedule of events that I've been doing this year that include all of most of the WRL races. Uh, we've done four champ car races. I've been doing a lot of autocross events and just did nationals, uh, a lot of track days, and just trying to do kind of a constant but very organic representation that this tire is still available and still competitive and still awesome and make sure that people see that it's out and about. I mean, the, the one thing that we've noticed, because we, uh, it, well, obviously we were following and you were in GLTC. We still follow GLTC. It's our favorite uh, racing on TV. Uh, the weird thing is, it seems to be one of the, I don't know how they're calling it, the super 21, 20, uh, 2100. I cannot talk tonight. Sorry, Tom. 200 treadwear tire. But the the weird thing, weird in a good way, is it seems to do well endurance racing, not just sprint racing, which is unique because all the other ones that I hear that are super, super fast are autocross, maybe sprint race, but the they're, you're not going to make it through a day of endurance race. Right. That is the nice part about this is that it's not that hard of a tire to endorse because it is really a very, very, very good tire. <laughs> it's my favorite for for endurance like that like you said in my experience all the others will fail before this one does mm -hmm. although we did go through left side tires like freaking crazy at the champ car race at ncm i did not expect that so we were throwing left sides out at every pit stop and everybody in the paddock is like this is supposed to be an amateur race anyway that aside it's be generally been completely fine everywhere else uh and if anybody was trying to do more with other tires i think it would have been worse for them uh, it's also the best for the rain. So if it starts to get a little cloudy and rainy and icky, it, you're probably the last car that has to come in off the pit stop. Um, so in general, it was, it's the tire I'd want to run anyway, which is super lucky for me that I get to race on it a lot now. I know. Miss Vicky's only gotten to race on it once because I, I am a, uh, well, let's say Checo is like a tire whisperer. I am a tire miser, I guess would be the best way. So if if we're not going for the gusto, which I know is anti-lizard brain, uh, we are in the uh, RS4 because those things, I mean, literally we can make a season out of those car, those tires because they just, unless we flat spot them. And granted, a season means like three races, maybe four. Sure. Yeah. So, But you, know, you could probably still do eight on them. Yeah. <laughs> they will I, last forever. They just don't go away. You have to flat spot them to make them die. They will not die. Yeah. Uh, but if we are going to go for it, the RE seventy one RS is the is the, uh, is the mm. issue of choice. We'll see, uh, we'll see what happens with the next four months. I think there's four new tires coming out total. I know Falcon has one. Mm -hmm. Hoosier comes out this week. Maxis just posted theirs. I've heard BFG is coming out with one new. So uh, we'll see. <laughs> It'll be fun. Then, I hope I can know. still speak as highly of it as possible next year without having to be like, except for that other weird one. <laughs> yeah. Or if Tom like gets noticeably, yeah. 
the the fake 200 yeah yeah piggy doesn't know that story do you want to go into that one a little bit or do you want to stay away? i would love to hear that story it's uh it's just kind of a shady person started making these shady tires that have 200 treadwear written on the side and they were mostly banned from all 200 treadwear competition because the person's shady and the tire is shady <laughs> that's oh. the long long version short yeah right just to, just imagine a tire that's really really sticky and and you know, essentially looks like the exact tire that's not rated 200 treadwares. And then you take a white magic marker and write on the side 200 treadwares. And, and it's one step above that. Oh, and the person wielding the marker is a person who's banned from every major organization in the United States right now, basically, for cheating at different levels. <laughs> so when I say ah. shady, it's a little shady. Yeah, so you're not, you're not, not talking tree, right? Huh? You're not talking tree. You're talking shady. Correct. Yeah. Yes, I got you. So, Mr. Gorman, what's your uh, race schedule coming up? It's busy. It's busy this month. I got to remember, uh, Indy is this week. Um, I got a call. This is crazy. This doesn't happen. in pro- Like, this is the kind of pro racing stories you hear about that, like, doesn't happen. I got a call, like, two weeks ago from a friend who runs an IMSA team that says, hey, my other teammate, he just hurt himself playing with his kid. He's got an abdominal injury. He's not sure it's going to be healed. Can you be there? And I said, of course, I'd love to be there. And if I wasn't going to race, I was going to spot. But... He called me on Sunday and said, hey, uh, we know John's not going to race. He wants to heal fully. We want you to race. So I'm going to Indy Motor Speedway this weekend to race a TCR car. It's one of the new, fast, like, second-gen Audis that can win a race. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, and then after that, I don't remember. We still have we still have Watkins Glen, Sebring, and, and Coda for WRL. Um, I still have Laguna Seca and Thunder Hill and Pitt for Grid Life. Um, TT Nationals for SCCA. Um, our track day, obviously a pit, and then there's just a bunch more kind of local autocrossy track day stuff. So any, my life's uh, busy in all the good, in all the best ways. Any announcing imminent or yeah, you know, the of? runoffs I'm on the runoffs announce team for the, what is the seventh year? Nice. Um, and it's at road America this year. So, uh, that's always cool. And it's still kind of, I, I can't believe we've been doing it that long, actually, now that I say that out loud. Um, but yeah, me, Larry McLeod are the SCCA member representatives, basically. And then they have John Fippen, who's the voice of Mid-Ohio. And they have Greg Kramer, who's the voice of American sports car racing, in my opinion. Pretty much everywhere. Yeah. 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 All right. So uh, I've got one and Vicky's got one. And then your your day is done, sir. You've put in your time. <laughs> no, uh, no. Then we go record Lizard Brains. Oh, you got Lizard Brains. In. Oh, yeah. sorry. All right. Well, we'll get you off soon then. So, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, so, so, Mr. O'Gorman. We're doing this again next year. And you're looking back on a great year for Tom O'Gorman. What did Tom O'Gorman do next year? Oh, Bill, oh man. So I have a, I have a, a little goal. I would, I, I've been talking to pit race a lot, actually. Um, and there seem to be a lot of good ways that I can work with the track. And I, now that I only live three hours away, the last time we talked also, I was still living in Wisconsin. I live in Ohio. Yep, now. You are. Yep. Um, I've, I've talked to them a lot, about a, a number of different ways to be involved with the track, including, maybe even hosting my own events out on that skid pad. I get mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of people asking for autocross coaching and car control coaching. And while I don't necessarily want to make a career out of coaching on an autocross skid pad, I think hosting those events would be like pretty, pretty fun. Uh, so I would like to look into that a little bit more. I, in a fantasy world, this IMSA race goes really, really well. Everybody remembers that I exist and something more happens with that next year. <laughs> Who knows? Um, Beyond that, I'd still love to be working in this capacity with Bridgestone where that gets me in a car this often. I don't know if you noticed, I've been putting a lot more content out because I got a new helmet camera and I've been having so much fun making little videos with my helmet camera between all the cars I get to drive and the events I get to go to. Um, I'm hoping to stay motivated with that. Sometimes you lose motivation with the social media stuff. And if that happens, I step away. But as long as you see videos posting and YouTube videos out, I have two or three new YouTube videos out in the last month. Like all of that, uh, that means I'm having fun. <laughs> so hopefully a lot more of that. Well, that Good sounds times. Good. Yeah. Miss Vicky. Yes. Your last one. Yeah. No? Okay. All right. I'll go with it then. Miss. No, the... I'm sorry. Do you have a document? Yeah. That's why you I haven't been. Have oh, that could be why you haven't asked any of the questions in the order. Yeah, I, I, don't have, I don't have a doc. Okay, I thought well. we were winging it. My well, bad. Well, we did, but that's fine. I'm sorry. She, she heard that's how we do lizard brains. So she's like, we'll do it the okay. lizard brains way. Yeah, right. I just kind of figured, and they kind of told me what the roundabout was. And I'm okay. just like, 
Okay, well, that would make sense. I thought we like waited the last one. I'm so like I thought, sitting there going, where is she? Why is she not answering yeah. these questions? Anyway, that's a little little peek behind the, behind the thing. I'm like, wow, she went way out of order on this one, but whatever. So, so Tom, as uh, let me do this. I'll be misspeaking. So, Tom, uh, <laughs> Bill really wants to go ice racing. Is this worth doing? And when is he going to be able to go? Ooh, yes. It's so fun. Um, is it? It's so fun. And it's actually, they call it ice racing. It's basically like ice autocross uh, in that you do point to point. It's not wheel to wheel. Um, the hardest part is just the weather being predictable. Like last year when I was still living in Wisconsin, I moved out uh, kind of partially into winter. But anyway, we didn't, we never got good conditions for snow, for ice racing. We actually had a snowmobile trip planned that had to get canceled because there wasn't enough snow. So, like, if that happens and you planned a trip, this just is what it is. But usually if you can travel to northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, I've heard they do it even in Maine um, and, like, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, Michigan, yep. for sure. Um, it's so much fun. The only other thing I would say, though, is don't take a car that you're super in love with the bodywork on. Because if they have high banks that are frozen, it's mm -hmm. almost like driving in a tunnel of concrete walls. So just keep that in mind, too. Ice is not the softest thing. We went ice boating or oh. ice sailing. That was a freaking blast. You would love what that. did you call it? Ice what? Ice, ice boating. Sailing. Ice sailing. Ice sailing. They're like that... sailboats. They're sailboats on lakes that basically have very large ice skates, rudders on them. And the fun. wind just takes them and they fly. You just skate on a boat right across there. And they're almost what would you say they're almost like a really narrow canoe it's, okay it's it's almost like a, a rowing skull yeah like a size. row like a crew boat with a sail but, on it. but they fly and, and then you know you there's uh if you want to carry a passenger there's like an outboard that the person gets in um what's like the hawaiian canoes that's what i was picturing okay yeah Right. And then the sale. And that was so freaking fun. Now, when we had gone out there, they had people on scooters that had ice blades on them. Hmm. And they had tracks on them. So they were doing, not to mention, they had ice skaters out there. And I remember one of them had one sail, but we came across a boat that had two sails. And it was going, that was crazy fun. Where where was this at? Just um, Connecticut. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they do that flat. fairly often. I oh, could see, yeah. uh, I could see some lizard brain activity going on there. <laughs> yeah, we've we've talked about like just trying different sports, different disciplines mm -hmm. of this type of stuff, just because w w it's so fascinating to learn. Like, I didn't know that was a thing. I'm, at first, I was picturing like a bobsled with a sail, but mm -hmm. I'm, like more like a canoe. That makes sense. And yeah, that ah, sounds like a blast. I want to try that. Yeah, go look that up on YouTube. It's okay. freaking fun. I <laughs> see. Until the wind dies. And then well, <laughs> you, you better be close to where you started yeah. if the wind dies. I, I, yeah. And then you got a couple guys out there that had a cooler in there. So they're just sitting out there on the ice, just drinking beer, waiting for the wind to come back. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how the ice racing is. It's like half the lake is the ice racing and half the lake is the ice fishermen. And there's no mingling, yeah. really, because that's their fisherman space and that's the car space. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's right over there. Fishing. So we can't keep you from the Lizard Brain podcast, which we highly recommend. Any other things that we need to make sure people keep aware of for you, Tom? I don't think so. I'd love to see as many of, of our friends at the Pit Race Track Day as much as possible, um, just because I know it's going to be a high quality day and I want to share that with my friends, uh, especially the skid pad. I'm so excited. I want to try like a reverse challenge. I don't know if you've ever autocrossed in the reverse gear, if you've ever autocrossed at all. Actually, I don't know if you guys have. We, have you? We, uh, well, Miss Vicky yeah, will say we that? have, but we've only done Evo School, so we haven't technically oh, okay. competed. But I, we, I guess we should know what we're doing. I would say we don't, but uh, we'll find out someday. Autocrossing in reverse is so fun. I want to do a little challenge with that there. Anyway, yeah, that that that's coming up. Is Otherwise, that, I is that the it. one the autocross autocross? In, okay, I see what you're saying. No, because there was a particular type of really really tight space autocross what is that where you're both oh. where you're parking into spots and you're spinning and and it's it's not fast but it's mm. kind of like drifting at the same time what is that that's like classic Jim Connor when you see Jim Connor like the the YouTube videos that got that right. <clears throat> they took that name and branded the YouTube videos Jim Connor and whatever 
technically old fat like old school Jim Connor is what you're picturing with the little like light tiny super sevens and they're doing reverse pirouettes and right. they follow a route through the tiny course. I yeah. I wanted to try that too. That looks really hard. <laughs> that looks really <laughs> really hard. I can imagine. Well, sir, it sounds like uh, you're going to be racing this weekend. We will be watching. I'll love that. And then we will see you in a few weeks at the, the Grid Life event. That'll be yeah. fun. Thanks again for having me on. It's always a, always a good time. Uh, never a problem, sir. Always welcome. Thank you, Tom. Definitely.